Pharma Ventures, experts in deals and alliances. Welcome to Pharma Ventures Insights at the 2017 Anglo Nordic Life Science Conference in London. Now, there's a UK based biotech that's striving to become a global pharmaceutical company based on their antibody therapeutics. Leading this biotech is a man who's regarded by the Financial Times as one of the godfathers of antibody therapeutics. Joining me today on Pharma Ventures Insights is David Chiswell, CEO of Chimab. Welcome, David. You have a very strong track record from Amersham, which is now a part of GE Healthcare, to Cambridge Antibody Technology, now owned by AstraZeneca, and you've been on the board of many biotechs and pharmaceutical companies. What made you choose Chimab? Well, I think Chimab, I joined the board in 2012 as the chairman, and it, it piqued my interest because I eat antibody, so that's going back to the roots that I grew up in. Um, but also the technology was fantastic. In my early days, Cambridge Antibody Technology was a phase display company and the mouse competitors really didn't have the technology platform, although actually they did succeed in getting some useful drugs. And what Alan Bradley and his team had done was create a, uh, what the mouse should be. And the mouse is, contains all the human antibody genes and a perfectly functioning immune system and they're fertile. So there's a lot you can do with it and I saw that as a, a one piece that was required to build a big company back in the UK. So that's what attracted me, the, the opportunity that, that the mouse platform gave us. Mm. And you're creating humanised antibodies, where you're getting mouse to create, uh, make humanised antibodies. Could you please explain the ChiMouse platform a little bit for us? Yeah, well, it's, it's, simplistically, we, we, we took the antibody genes that make antibodies for us, out of us humans, and in what, what was, and it probably still is, the biggest mouse genomic engineering project, Alan and his team put all those antibodies in the right place in the mouse. So the mouse now sits there, it's a perfectly normal mouse. Whenever we immunise or vaccinate it, we get antibodies against the target, which we expect in a normal mouse. It just so happens the mouse is creating antibodies that are genetically human. So our plan now is to use those antibodies that are genetically human, put them back into people as therapeutics. And Chimab's the, the world leader in this technology. Y yes, yes. I mean, there's quite a lot of ways of making antibodies nowadays, um, but we believe that we have the best way of making the best antibodies. Mm. And looking at Chimab's pipeline of products or assets in development, you're in immuno-oncology, infectious diseases, immunotherapy in general, yes. and blood diseases as well. Yes. That's a quite a diverse range of therapeutic areas. How, what's, what was your thought process in, in choosing those therapeutic areas? Well, well in, so in some cases, when you're a platform company, it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to say, well, where are you going to develop it? We have ambitions to be a big company, um, so therefore we need to develop products that are, are, are our own. And I think in the early stage, you very much a uh, individual scientist would propose options, and then of those that succeeded and come to the top of the pile, we then say, okay, well this looks like it's a really good product candidate, how do we take it forward? And the usual answer is, we need to bring somebody into the company that knows the area. So we build our therapeutic areas on early success in antibody development, and early success in models that say this is going to look good. Then we try and attract somebody who knows what they're talking about, and then around them we can build this whole area of focus. So, Humira, we have to come back to Humira mm -hmm. because that's a very, very huge drug. You know, thirteen billion dollars in revenue in one year, and Cambridge Antibody Technology was was pivotal in in, in developing Humira or coming up with Humira in collaboration with BASF, yes. now owned by uh, Abvi. Um, so from from that time until now, you've been you've been quite heavily involved in the life science deals and transactions. Do you see any trends back in you know trends from then to now? Anything different? Anything that's any well, changes? Well, I mean, seen? what's different in the antibody field is that back in the days when we did the deal with with BSF, which was 1993, if I remember, um, very few big pharma wanted antibodies. Um, uh, BSF saw there was an opportunity. Um, in part because they had a manufacturing plant already in Worcester, Mass. So there was a, you know, how do we fill that action? But most, most pharma then were looking on antibodies as, well, they're biologicals, we don't do biologicals, we do, we do small molecules. Quite the contrary it, Absolutely now. right, and yeah. now you look around and everybody's got antibodies. Everybody wants antibodies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so to some extent antibodies are commodities, but that doesn't mean there isn't a real opportunity for them, because they're now well-proven therapeutics. Everybody wants them, they have their own characteristics, 
and it's just a change, you know, like a complete change, but there's still a fantastic opportunity for new antibodies. Mm. So I think it's, it's still more of the same, although it's all changed. This is a more of a spontaneous question, but what do you think the next hot thing will be? Before it was small molecules, now it's antibodies. What, what's, what's next? Yeah, good, yeah, good question. Well, I mean, to be honest, I, mean, I think things evolve biologically. And at the moment, for example, small molecules have been developed into a relatively small number of candidates. Um, antibodies are currently restricted to you know, soluble proteins, cell surface proteins. We'd like to be able to hit intracellular targets. So I think you know, a way of opening up the target basket to intracellular targets and moving out of protein targets into nucleic acid targets, I think that would be a, a good way forward. Would Chimap be open to those evolutions? Well, uh, no, I think we have to stick to our knitting to some extent. If we're an antibody company, let's stay there. Um, but we can evolve into a different sort of antibody. Company. But I think the early, the early categories of our products are, are going to be plain vanilla-ish antibodies, albeit human, and, but then I'm sure we will evolve into different structures and different targets. Mm. So late last year you closed Series C funding round, £150 million pounds, or $150 million thereabouts, and you had some new investors, some follow-on in investment from existing funders. Yes. Um, what was the strategy when going about um, raising the money and what will that be used for? Well, if we, if we go back a little bit to the funding of the company from the beginning, the first funding, the Series A, which was $30 million, if we took in dollars, I suppose, was from the Wellcome Trust. And that was really to build the mouse. And that was the mouse, so that was in 2010. So that was, it was strategic, we'll build the mouse, and that was done in 2012, although we're still building variants of the mouse. The second funding, which is the Series B, that was to say, okay, we have the mouse. We want to build a pipeline, but we want to build it broad, but not in the time we have, take them too far forward. So it was take the mouse and build an early stage pipeline, which is what brought in the Gates Foundation to build our infectious disease area. He brought in Malin and Woodford, and also the Wellcome Trust. But, and and, and the, the, the CDC um, plan is always, well, we have a pipeline now, but it's very early. Let's take it into the clinic. Let's get some clinical data. Let's move it so we have five or six programs actually in the clinic driving the value of the company in real therapeutic data. Now, you touched on Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, mm. and, I, and I have to come back to it because mm. it's a very interesting story. At the time when they first invested in Chimab, they put in maybe about $20 million, yes. Yes. and it was the first time they'd ever invested in a biotech company. So that must have been a great val validation. It was actually. I mean, I mean, and also, they then also we have grant funding from them, and, that, and, the, and the relationship has evolved because they saw at that time the mouse, which had a human antibody, uh, antibodies in it, was an ideal target for them for vaccine development, because if you're trying to develop a vaccine, you want to know how antibodies develop against it, and testing that in humans is not really very good. So we, we were using the mouse, we still are, as a vaccine candidate developer, but now we're also beginning to find therapeutic antibody targets to suit us both. So the evolution of that is the Gates came in and the city C as well. They've, we've restructured the relationship so they give us more of a program grant, and you know, the relationship has got deeper as, as, as time goes on, because I think both sides think, well, actually, we're working well together. We, 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 we've built a, uh, an infectious disease therapeutic area, which we wouldn't have done without their involvement, and hopefully they find that we're useful in providing both vaccine assays and also therapeutic antibodies to, to targets that are of interest to them as well as us. It looks like they're targeting infectio infectious diseases as a huge um, area for them to invest in, and, yes. they're, and they're looking at Chimab as sort of a cornerstone um, company to, to be doing that. So. Yes, yes, and, and, and uh, I think since then they've invested in, in quite a few more companies. It's part of a model now to invest to make sure the company is stable and financially, and that also you get to return with any luck, um, and then to, to, to add grant funding to get the company to do more what you want to do, which works for us because if we're working on a, um, a developing world disease, um, we still have rights in the developed world. So in some areas that the, the rights aren't mm -hmm. worth much, but in other areas actually that in the travellers market or the military market or just generally we suffer from the same diseases, uh, I think that is a really big advantage yeah, you know, it's, going forward. It's a very interesting business model. It is, yeah. it is. So it looks like whenever, whenever we're at conferences um, or talking to large pharma investors in general, immuno-oncology, immunotherapy and infectious diseases seem to be the flavour of the month or flavour of the season or few years yeah, yeah, for, even. A few years, yes. <laughs> um, um, is that why Chimab's in, in this business? Well, I mean, I think it was obvious to us a few years back that we needed to play in the space of immune oncology 
Now, actually, if you think about that, there's quite a few links between infectious disease and immuno-oncology. The whole concept of uh, current immuno-oncology comes from exhausted T cells. And T cells, and, and that concept of uh, late on an infection, your T cells can just say, well, we've had enough, we can't cope. And, and, and out of that came, well, actually, does the same exist in oncology, where the cancer is beating your immune system into submission. And then if you start to intervene at these points, you, know, you can actually get you know, substantial improved treatment in cancer, like you get substantial improved treatment in some in, so infectious disease. So uh, the, whole, the whole areas are linked biologically. Um, now, obviously, immune oncology is just like a train. It's really going, there's a, lot, there's a lot in there, but there's a lot to play for. I mean, if you look at uh, how Keytruda and the anti-PD1s, PDL1s are working, they're working fantastically well, but if you look at the long-term response rate, it's, we're still in the 30% area. We really ought to be in the 70% area. So how are we going to get from the 30%, I mean, 30 from 10% is great, and then we have to get from 30 to 50 to 70. So I think there's a, there's a lot to play in there, and obviously a lot, of, a lot of people are playing there, so that's why it's so exciting. I believe you once said that Chimab, Chimab's goal, long-term goal, is to become a Europe-based global pharmaceutical company. Yes. Uh, a Europe-based, Europe, basically the European Genentech, really. Right. Um, d does that mean you're, you're looking to commercialise all your, your therapeutic um, products Eventually. to the end? Eventually. I mean, I think Take them to market? Yeah, part of our plan is that at some point in the future we will be selling our own products. That doesn't mean the first products we develop we'll be selling or selling on our own. So I think there's, a, um, there's a, an evolution of company that we need. We need to build our company's ca capability to do that. So uh, our first product, which will go into man very soon, um, is not in immune oncology, it, it's in treatment of autoimmune diseases. But again, there's a lot of those. So how, can you, how do you work your way through the path the, of autoimmune diseases? And we know where we want to go to get proof of concept, but we also know that we need to bring partners in to, to develop the, the full benefit of that program. And that will be the same in immuno-oncology. We can't really credibly market ourselves against the, the world that is now immuno-oncology. So we're always looking that's to build our capability as a company, and we're always looking at therapeutic areas where we may be able to build on our own. And over the next you know, few years, we intend to do that. When it comes to immuno-oncology or immunotherapy products, accessibility and affordability of these products for patients that are in need is, is often quite a hot topic. What's KiMAPS, what's your thinking on that? Well, I, I think our products are going to be on sale in 10, 15 years' time. It's a long time to work out what the, uh, the payers are going to do in, in different countries. So what we have to look at is, what we have to do is we have to dramatically alter the course of a disease. It's no use making it a little bit better, because actually the cost of our drugs is going to be so high that making it a little bit better isn't going to do. Isn't going to do. Or if you compete it against Humira, well actually it's no use being a few percent better, you've got to be dramatically better. So I think there's, 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 there's a, a, a hurdle that we have to set for ourselves which is really change the course of disease. And I think if you really change the course of disease, then we will find people able to pay it because the economic benefits and the personal benefits will be so good that we have to keep our goals in mind. For more information about Pharma Ventures, visit our website.